The cyberpunk Edgerunner universe is full of characters upgrading their bodies with cybernetic implants. For some, it works out great, and for others, let's say, not so great. I'm Dr. Maddie, one of your doctors from the UK, and today we're going to be following the character of David as he goes from an average everyday punk to a full-on cyberpunk. I'm going to be breaking down David's cybernetic implants, explaining the science of how these work. I'll also be talking about the science behind cyberpsychosis, immune modulators, and the villain's big bad, Adam Smasher. But before we begin, don't forget to give this video a like, consider subscribing to the channel, and let me know down in the comments if there's any other aspect of the cyberpunk universe you'd like me to break down. With that being said, if you're ready, let's begin. Okay, so first up we see that David comes up against a school bully and it looks like everyone in this world has almost like a micro SD card slot in their neck and depending what's uploaded on their chip will determine what they're capable of. Now this is very reminiscent of movies like The Matrix or Johnny Mnemonic but is something like this possible? I know Kung Fu. Show me. Well, rather than asking this question, it might be more useful to ask a different one, which is what would this chip have to be doing to enable it to work? And just by the way the character's moving in this scene, it makes it look like this chip gives you a preset of movements, rather than giving you conscious control of your body. So, for this chip to be working, it would need access to your spinal cord and your peripheral nervous system from your neck down allowing it to take control of your four limbs. Now, although we don't have something as sophisticated as this, we do have what are called nerve stimulators, which help to restore the function in people who've suffered from either a stroke, nerve damage, or conditions like Parkinsonism. And an example of how this might work is causing a muscle to contract, enabling people to stand up. We're just not at that Kung Fu stage yet. <laughs> Okay, so next up we see that David takes on a full bionic spine. Firstly, I'd have to say I doubt someone would be able to survive such an intense procedure, but for argument's sake, let's say they could. Now, what are the advantages of having a bionic spine as opposed to a normal spinal system? Well, you can kind of imagine the spine as a highway for electrical signals to travel from the brain to your body. Now, the normal spine is an organic structure and thereby it has the limitation of every organic structure. It will get old, it will degrade, and with time, it won't function as it once did. And what this results in is a slowing of our movements as we age and a diminishing of our reflexes. Let's say if this spinal implant could somehow increase the efficiency or the speed that those signals are sent from your brain to your limbs, then it might give you a quicker reaction time, reducing the time loss between thought and action. The only limitation from there on would be the body itself and whether it can actually keep up with all these signals. <laughs> Okay, so here is the rematch between David and that class bully, and he's got this new ability to move into an almost bullet time mode. Again, very reminiscent of the movie The Matrix. Now, I'd expect that this is as a result of a spinal implant quickening those signals from your brain to your limbs. But I can imagine that moving at such speed must have a massive impact on your body and muscles. You know, our movements aren't only determined by nerve signaling. We have to have an adequate blood supply rich in oxygen and nutrients. Now, certainly our muscles have the capacity for what's called anaerobic respiration, where they operate at a lower blood supply, but this tends to be only for short periods. And this might help to explain why David similarly can only do this for short spells. So David predictably collapses in this scene as one of the characters state that he's suffering from a rookie's mistake. And I suspect this is due to the brain being overwhelmed by the presence of this new spinal implant. 
You know, signals go from the brain to the limbs, but they also come back to the brain, giving feedback to recalibrate things. Now, with a normal spine, the brain can cope with the amount of feedback signaling it gets. But when you've got a super-powered spine like this, it's easy for it to get overwhelmed. You can kind of imagine it like a computer. The more you ask of it, the slower it becomes before it ultimately crashes. So presumably the spinal implant can be used up to a certain degree, depending on the tolerance of the user, beyond which they might crash. What David really needs is a bionic brain to help process all this information. Otherwise, exposure to that amount of signaling over a long period of time could cause you to have a mental breakdown and cause permanent brain damage. Okay, so our doctor here says that if you use this implant excessively, you could go what's called cyber psycho, which we'll come to talk about shortly. But he also talks about the need to use immune modulators. But what are these and what are they used for? So the name kind of gives it away. These drugs help your body to better tolerate the cybernetic implants. But why wouldn't a body just accept the implants and allow them to integrate? Well, it's actually due to a protective mechanism that your body's immune system has. Your body's immune system is on constant high alert, looking out for anything that it identifies as not belonging, whether that's a protein, a bacteria, or a foreign body. And if your body does recognize something, it turns on its defense mechanisms to get rid of it. So immune modulators basically suppress your body's natural response to want to fight something which is foreign. Ideally, for these cybernetic implants, it's given at a dosage to allow your body to better tolerate the cybernetic implants, but not suppress your immune system to the point that you're open to any sort of infection. But I can imagine without regular blood testing, it would be very tricky to know if you're getting the dose right. Now, immune modulators are a real thing. Many of my patients are taking them, and that might be for a transplant they've received or treating a chronic inflammatory condition. What we do to ensure that they're on the correct dose is we bring them in for regular blood monitoring to make sure they're not getting any side effects from being on them. The problem for David is that it doesn't look like such a service is available for him, at least not with this doctor. <laughs> Okay, so next up here, we see that David's starting with some body modification as he notices the limitations of his physiology. And the first thing he opts for are new lungs. And I'm guessing this upgrade is going to allow him to take more oxygen with each breath, thereby allowing him to possibly run longer and increase his general exercise tolerance. An additional advantage of this is that he might be able to improve his anaerobic respiration, so his ability to exercise without oxygen. And as a result, he might be able to stay a bit longer in this bullet time mode. However, my advice is that it also need to upgrade the heart because it's no good super oxygenating your blood if you don't have the heart to pump it to the muscles quicker and also take away the waste products quicker too. And a side effect of prolonged anaerobic respiration is the buildup of more lactic acid in your muscles, which will make the recovery even harder. So you need a stronger circulatory system to get rid of those waste products. <laughs> Oh god, I thought this guy was a complete cyborg. I guess the blood splatter and the brains going everywhere tells me otherwise. And I'm guessing that this guy who shot him has this cyber psychosis that we've heard about. A little bit more on that shortly. <laughs> Okay, so here we're beginning to see additional detrimental effects of the cybernetic implants, with them having episodes of tremor and disorientation. Now, a tremor can occur for a number of reasons, from things like insufficient dopamine levels in the brain through to abnormally functioning reflex pathways. Interestingly, another mechanism is having high levels of metals in your bloodstream, which I think is going on here. Now, there is a medical condition that's similar to this called Wilson's disease, where you get very high levels of iron in the blood, and as a result, this deposits in the brain, leading to neurological symptoms, one of which is a tremor. For this guy, I think he might have to take off some of these cybernetic implants. <laughs> Thank you. 
And here I think we're seeing a full-blown cyber psychosis. But what do I mean by this? Well, by definition, psychosis occurs where you have a severe mental disorder which leads to your thoughts and emotions being so impaired that you lose contact with the external reality. And that's what we see here over the course of this episode, where Maine slowly becomes detached from reality, ultimately resulting in the demise of his partner. Now, psychosis can occur for a number of reasons, through from medical conditions like schizophrenia, through to medication side effects, but it can also occur as a result of having these high levels of circulating metals, like in Wilson's disease that I described earlier. But for Maine, I suspect that is a combination of factors from the immune modulators he's taking, through to the overload his brain gets from these cybernetics, and possibly due to some of these metals seeping into his bloodstream. So with the death of Maine, it looks like David steps up to be the leader of the Edge Runner group. And as promised to Maine earlier, he's taken on his cybernetic arms. Now, with this upgrade, I'd imagine the mechanics are based off of wires as opposed to nerves, which should enable him to keep up in his bullet time mode. And just to compare the speed of a nerve to that of a wire, a nerve signal travels at a speed of about 50 meters per second, whereas an electrical signal over a nerve is about 90% the speed of light. So around 250,000 kilometers a second. That's a hell of a lot quicker. And it looks like David got lower limb implants too, allowing his feet to keep up with the rest of his body. To be honest, I think that was a wise decision because I don't think that his human feet would be able to mechanically keep up from an attack like this. And once again, we're seeing here that David's body is getting overwhelmed by the burden of these cybernetic implants, leading to dizziness, shaking, and nausea. And we hear that he's demanding much stronger immunomodulators from the doctor, with the hope of stopping his body from rejecting the implants. However, all of these symptoms are signs that his body is getting overwhelmed, his nerves are getting fried, his heart is working overtime, and his brain isn't able to cope with the burden of all these signals. By increasing these immunomodulators further, you're putting yourself at risk of the side effects of that medication, but also suppressing your immune system to the point where you don't have any defenses. His only choice now would be to swap out those organs completely and become a cyborg like Adam Smasher, otherwise he's going to burn through the limits of his human body. <laughs> So here we see that David's taken a deep dive in throwing on a full cybernetic skeleton. Now this will definitely equip him to the teeth with weaponry, but it's also going to put a massive further load on his nervous system and his remaining human parts. I suspect at this point he's probably more cyborg than he is human. And we can see that throughout this episode he's beginning to lose touch with reality and possibly going into this cyberpsychosis state, with it looking like the immunomodulators being the only thing that can give him a temporary form of consciousness. I suspect that David only has a small window of opportunity to save his friends but maybe at the cost of his own life. And so here we see the doctor talking about how these will likely be the last vials that David will be able to use, and there won't be any coming back to sanity from this. Now, every medication that we give as doctors works within what we call a safe therapeutic window. If we give too little, it's ineffective, and if we give too much of it, you're likely to put your body at risk of side effects. Although this hefty dose of immune modulators might work in the short term, at nine times the usual dose, you're definitely in serious side effect territory. I mean, imagine if you took nine times a dose of paracetamol. We'd call that an overdose, and you'd need urgent treatment. Oh, 
I feel so sorry for David here. He's had such a sad backstory with losing his mum, his role model in Maine, and now he's clearly gone psychotic. We can tell that he's lost touch with reality with him hallucinating. He's clearly in the cyber psychosis territory. Oh, this cyber skeleton has a crazy amount of power, allowing David to take out whole platoons. And goodness, that anti-gravity weapon looks brutal. And it looks to work by concentrating gravity in a single spot, making everything within its zone that much heavier. I mean, it's pretty creative using gravity as a weapon. Just by increasing it slightly, you could cause every molecule in your body to become heavier. As a result, this could lead to things like your eyes popping out of their sockets, your blood pooling in your feet, leading you to collapse, and also your joints collapsing under your own body weight. It would really be a horrifying death. So here is Adam Smasher and he makes a great entrance. He looks like a brutal character with a very iconic design. He almost looks like a villain from the Robocop franchise. And I'm guessing that this is what David would have turned into if he continued with his body modification. So here we see David questioning Adam Smasher as to whether he swapped his brain out for a cybernetic implant. Now the advantage of swapping your brain out and becoming a full cyborg would be that you'd only now think in a binary fashion, unhindered by human emotion. Making every decision that he took either black or white, and not being slowed down by human indecisiveness. For someone like David who's still clinging onto his humanity, he has no chance against Adam Smasher. Oh, so with Lucy effectively saved here by David, we see Adam Smasher in hot pursuit. And unfortunately, we see him take out this fan favorite character, Rebecca, in a brutal way. I have to say that after Adam Smasher, she was definitely one of my favorites too. <laughs> And ultimately, it's a sad end for David as he came up against Adam Smasher, but we probably all saw this coming. Humans probably aren't supposed to merge with technology to this extent, and where we end up drawing the line is going to be really interesting. Clearly, there are advantages to the use of cybernetics, particularly within medicine. Let's just hope that we don't end up creating an Adam Smasher. <laughs> Okay guys, those are all the scenes I wanted to break down today. Please let me know down in the comments if there's any other aspect of this cyberpunk universe you'd like me to break down. Otherwise, if you want to continue on the channel, I'll recommend one of these two videos. And if I don't see you there, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks.